Well, turning your mobile phone off is the first step on the spiritual journey. <laughs> and it's very difficult to do. It's amazing how many people just completely blank out on that. I think it's partly because a lot of people don't know how to turn off their mobile phone. <laughs> Uh, but also, there's a kind of a, a, a blocking of, of it. There's a, f a fear that you're not going to be, you know, connected. So uh, make a little extra effort uh, to, to keep it off because um, it sets you free to be, to be more present and more, uh, more in the present moment. Well, again, thank you very much for your welcome and for the wonderful spirit of hospitality and uh, friendship and, uh, and efficiency uh, which, with which uh, we've all been greeted here today. It's, it's a wonderful beginning to what I'm sure is going to be a, a, a very special week. And I think there, are, there will be anyway over the, over the week uh, meditators and, 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 and guests and friends from 10, ten countries uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful gathering of, uh, of meditators in this, in this family and their friends. So uh, if you're new to the community, uh, you're most welcome. Uh, we, we did say, actually, didn't we, at lunchtime, that uh, you had a little introduction to meditation uh, earlier this afternoon, and I'll do a short, a brief one before we meditate this evening. But uh, maybe tomorrow afternoon sometime, there could be also a an optional uh, question and answer session. If any, anyone is new to meditation and you have some questions, uh, you can come along or if you've started to meditate and you've stopped and starting again. Anyway, if you would like to have a little refresher in the essential teaching, then uh, we'll arrange that sometime tomorrow afternoon. We'll announce that, I'm sure, tomorrow. Well, uh, let's, let's just take a, a, a few moments of quiet uh, to, ooh, yes, <laughs> to, uh, to gather ourselves. We always begin the John Main Seminar with a, a retreat so that we can listen more deeply and more clearly to what uh, the presenter and David this year is going to share with us. But also in itself, it's a, a very special opportunity at any time in our culture and our society to, to take uh, a couple of days uh, of silence and, and stillness. So just to prepare for that, let's take a moment to gather ourselves, to be present. And what I do with, uh, often when meditating with children, is uh, if they're a little bit uh, distracted or hyper, just to ask them to listen to the sound of the gong uh, and, until they can no longer hear it and then they put up their hand when they can't hear it anymore. You don't have to do that. But uh, it's really just a, a little exercise in uh, training the attention. So let's, uh, so I'll, I'll do that a couple of times as we, just as we prepare uh, this evening. First of all, we have to learn to be present to ourselves, to our deeper selves. And that means we begin a journey from the surface of our minds where we flitter around most of the time, solving problems or imagining problems, and allow ourselves to become present to a deeper reality. And then as that deeper presence uh, emerges, we realize that we can become more present to each other, to others. 
And that's why meditation has this great gift of creating attention and creating community through that attention. And the gift of enabling us to relate to each other more directly at that deeper level of trust and friendship. And as that presence to others matures and broadens, we realize that we are present to the world, to the planet, to the suffering and the needs of our fellow human beings. We live in a, this week, in a very tense and anxious time globally because of the tragedies in France. We realize that we are present to, to all of that and to all of those who have suffered and to those who are frightened of the future. And as that quality of presence deepens and expands, we realize that we are present to presence, to the presence of the one who is present, to the one who is, and to the one who is with us, and to the one who is for us. to Christ and to the one who sent him. Good. So, I didn't ask you whether you can hear me. Okay, everyone can hear? Yes? Thank you. And can you see as much of me as you want? Yes? <laughs> Even better. Great. Well, the theme of the retreat is, it sounds a little um, prosaic, really. Meditation as a modern spiritual path. But I'd like to uh, explore why we meditate uh, in itself, and why we medit how we meditate, and how we understand meditation as a spiritual path in this day and age. This is a very ancient tradition. You can trace it back to the dawn of human consciousness 40,000 years ago, at least. And we find meditation and 
at the heart of all the great religious traditions which began to take their present shape uh, in that period we call the Axial Age, about 500 years before Christ. The, age, the era of the Hebrew prophets and the Buddha and Confucius and the Upanishads. And meditation is rolled over. The meditation is passed on. It's a tradition. The word tradition means a handing on, like a relay race. And we have received this great universal human wisdom from way back. And we ourselves are part of that chain of events which is passing it on to the next generation. And we're very conscious of that in our community because of the work we do with teaching meditation to children. But we do that Although there's something timeless about meditation, it's also very much in enculturated, and I'm sure David is going to open up that meaning of the, the, the present historical context in which we live a spiritual path. So that's what I'd like to reflect on during the retreat, but the real purpose of the retreat is to give us a chance to enter into a, a stronger and a deeper silence and to become more fully present. Now, the first thing to make that possible is you have to want to do it, which I think is why you've come on a retreat, come on the retreat before the seminar. You have to want to do it. And then, secondly, we each need to make a little effort to make that happen and to respect uh, <clears throat> the other people who want it as well. So to help them. If we see ourselves uh, as helping each other to come into this silence and into this presence, then uh, it will be a successful retreat. Even if you forget everything that I've said in my talks, uh, the quality of silence, the quality of presence, the friendship that grows out of that during the these few days of retreat and the times of meditation themselves will do their work and we will be enriched and changed uh, by that. But even though there's this timeless element to meditation, uh, we're also always meditating as human beings within the frame of our own lives we don't know, we, we pretty well know where we, where we began. We fill out our date of birth often enough on forms. Uh, we don't know what the final date at the other end is going to be. Makes life interesting. Uh, but we live our journey of meditation within that frame of, of our own personal lives. But of course, we also live it as historical beings, members of a particular culture, in a particular era. I came across an interesting uh, discovery recently, the International Commission on Stratiography. <laughs> but you don't even know what stratiography is, do you? You're so, so ignorant. Uh, <laughs> well, stratiography, as I discovered, is that branch of geology that studies the strata, you know, the, the layers of rocks that make up the, the record of our of our planet. And this International Commission on Stratigraphy decides what to name the period that we're living in. Uh, and it calls our era the Anthropocene era, which means the, the era which has been dominated by the human. We are having an intense influence on our environment and on our planet. And because of this major impact of human life on Earth, we are no longer living in what they used to, used to call the Holocene period, that sort of this integrated period where all the different systems of the planet work together. Now the anthro that, that sort of holistic uh, period has given way to this one where the human uh, dominates and influences the systems, 
the delicate balance of the, of the planet. Through our population explosion, through our fossil fuels, through the demands of, uh, made on water supply, on the destruction of habitats, the loss of species, and the debris of civilization, the waste, the atomic fallout, and the indestructible uh, mountains of plastic that we, we create. So that's one way of understanding this era, this period of history that differentiates us from other times. It's one of the things we mean by modern. But as we explore that and the significance of that fact, no, no denying that we are in this new era where the human is dominating the planet and influencing it, threatening it, uh, we discover that there is an even deeper significance or characteristic of this era, which is the importance of human self-understanding. It has never been more important than that hu human beings understand themselves in order to be able to shape the future. There's a Chinese saying, which might sound pretty obvious at first, which is that if you are going in a certain direction and you don't do something to change it, then you will get to where you are going. <laughs> Very profound, isn't it? <laughs> so, unless we make a decision, unless we decide to change direction, we will end up pretty much in the direction which we're heading. So, it's our self-understanding that is going to change that. Self-knowledge is the most important thing we have to produce today. The desert teachers of the Christian tradition, the early uh, monks, the men and women of the Egyptian desert especially, who gave us our way of meditation back in the 4th, 5th centuries. The desert uh, monks used to say self-knowledge is more important to gain and develop than the ability to work miracles. Self-knowledge is more important than miracles. And we live in an age of miracles. You know, it's uh, you think of what happened in the last 60 years from, uh, you know, the first manned flight to landing on the moon, 60 years. Pretty incredible. So we live in an age of uh, immense change and miraculous uh, technology. But more important than the miracles, one iPhone has more computing power than the spaceship that took uh, the men to the moon. So this age of miracles is, is, is amazing and wonderful to celebrate and it has done some very good things as well. But more important than that is our own self-knowledge. And that leads us into the era and the whole area of mystery. Einstein said that the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. Imagination, he says, is more important than knowledge. And Muhammad said, he who knows himself knows God, which is also the basis of Christian mystical theology. Self-knowledge is the foundation of our knowledge of God. And I think it's important to understand that, to bring that to mind as we reflect on the uh, intensely painful and frightening uh, events and tragedies in France in the last few days and the 
massive trauma that that has created glo globally. We need that self-knowledge to be able to keep it in perspective without in any way diminishing its, uh, its importance. In, on the 24th of August, 1572, the Catholics went on a rampage in Paris, St. Bartholomew's Day, and killed at least 3,000 Protestants. And the next few days, this, this sort of uh, Congo-like or, or um, uh, Rwanda-like uh, massacre spread throughout France, and many more thousands were, of Protestants were massacred. So, one of the things that we come to see as we grow in self-knowledge are the patterns of our experience. We notice this, I think, uh, as we meditate, we begin to grow in psychological self-knowledge, self-awareness. We begin to be aware of the patterns of our own mind, some of the obsessive, repetitive, patterns that we, uh, we get compulsive about, our anxieties, our obsessions, our addictions, our, our, uh, our fears, our fantasies, the things we chew over and over again, uh, like, re, re, you know, the replay of old TV, TV shows. But we can also see these patterns, and we need to see these patterns, in our culture, in our world, in our society, the pattern of violence, the pattern of how we respond to violence with more violence, and how this pattern leads nowhere. Just as when we become compulsive or addictive or obsessive about our own problems, our own uh, anxieties, we get nowhere. We don't grow, we don't develop, and we know we're not getting anywhere. We feel our lives are being dragged down into some pit, into some sludge. Uh, so that can happen to us, and indeed has happened to us in many ways as a, as a, as a, as a human race. So self-knowledge has to begin somewhere. And self-knowledge, we could almost say, is the is the dynamic or the dynamo that drives human development and social development. It's not a simple development because we, we go two steps forward and one step back. We think we've become very civilized and then we just realize just how primitive and how controlled by our shadow and our dark side we can be. But the first level of self-knowledge is our own body. A child first begins to experience, experience anything in and through the body, their own body. As a child, the pain and the joys of the body. In adolescence, the confusion and the wonder of the body developing. And all the surprises of how the body and the senses unfold. And then we begin to realize as in a second stage of self-knowledge that thoughts and feelings also influence the body. That the way we think, the way we feel, and the attitudes to life that we are uh, developing the belief systems that we begin to hold, all of these influence us as a whole person. And then we realize that there is a whole new universe waiting to be known within ourselves, to be explored in our minds, in our memories, in our ideas, in our imagination, in our creativity, and through our mistakes including how to deal with and to reduce, uh, sorry, how, how to deal with what reduces our universe, shrinks our world. That's to say the negative states of mind, such as fear and anger and greed 
desire, pride, and despair. These faults, these eight principal faults, as the desert teachers call them. I spoke of it, I gave a series of talks about them recently. And uh, these, these states of mind uh, contract our world. They make us live in smaller and meaner and, and tighter little, little selves. So we have to know how to deal with these. We have to recognize them, identify them, and then we have to deal with them. And that work leads us, pushes us into the third stage of self-knowledge, which is when we discover the interior world of transcendence that we call the spiritual, in which even that opposition of inner and outer is transcended. When we really go to a true interiority, and that's what meditation takes us to, a true, authentic interiority, we find that we are transcending this split between inner and outer. So true interiority, which we discover th through meditation, for example, is, uh, we discover it through any experience of love or beauty and goodness as well. But uh, this true experience of interiority is very different from just introversion, just being fixated upon ourselves in a narcissistic state of self-referencing and self-centeredness. We begin to see there's a real difference between the ego and the self. And that is the second step after turning off your mobile phone. Uh, the second step is to be aware of this distinction between the ego and the true self. And that can come quite late in life for some people, quite amazingly. I was struck uh, some time ago talking to a student of mine who'd been doing a course with me and um, she was probably in her very early 20s, 21, 22 maybe. And she said uh, she came from a non-religious family and she'd been interested in the course because there was meditation as part of it. And she discovered meditation. She said, I wasn't interested in religion, really. I wasn't against religion. I just wasn't interested in it. But I was, I, I did get into meditation. And she said, uh, she said it was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful thing to discover. She said, I, I uh, discovered for the first time that I had an inner life. This is a very intelligent, you know, normal, balanced, successful uh, young woman in the modern world, just discovering what interiority meant. So we discover this through an experience of transcendence. It's going to involve some pain because self-knowledge always involves uh, the, uh, some, some difficulties, some pain. We find a unity in things. We see the world through the lens of a personal simplicity that develops through the practice. As we become more simple, personally, we begin to see the world as a unity. We find ourselves at peace. We find the peace we are all looking for. Where the spirit is, there is unity, St. Paul says. And where there is oneness, there is peace. <coughs> so these are, you know, three ways we could, we could think about the stages of self-knowledge. I don't think you write in your diary on the 13th of January, uh, you know, moved into uh, the third stage of self-knowledge today. <laughs> but anyway, these are little maps that, that might help to recognize some of the interlocking and, in, and, and often interconnecting uh, 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 phases by which we grow in self-knowledge. I thank thee, Lord, for the wonder of my being. It says in the Psalms, I thank thee, Lord, for the wonder of my being. 
And this discovery, if you think that little phrase, a little verse from the Psalms, how much is packed into that? Gratitude, the spontaneous arising of a feeling of thankfulness. Not because we've got something, own something, possess something, but just through the being itself, the, the, the thankfulness of being. The discovery of gratitude, of gift, pure gift, gift that isn't there to manipulate us, to dominate us, to trick us, or to demand something in return, but a gift that is truly a free gift. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, buy two, get one free. Because <laughs> you, you, you know it's not free, because if you were to say to the assistant, could I just have the free one, please? <laughs> uh, they'd look at you as if you're crazy, because you don't, don't get the point. So, here's a real gift, something that is truly gracious, truly free. And wonder. Wonder is that awareness of a reality that is beyond our understanding, but not beyond our capacity to experience. That's wonder. I can't explain it, but I know that it's there. I know that it's touching me. I know that it's uh, inside of me. It's like Mary pondering on the mysteries of Jesus, even though she couldn't understand what, what it was all about. And being itself, I thank the Lord for the wonder of my being, my, not just my existence in the world, in, in uh, Hamilton uh, or wherever. It's not just my existence in this particular historical time and place, but my being. Wherever I existed, my being would be the same. And that, in essence, I think, is the whole human process and the meaning of that process. It's universal, which means that and it, it's, a, it's universally necessary, it's universally uh, meaningful and important. And so if we die without experiencing it, if we were to die without experiencing the wonder of our being, we would feel that we've missed something. I'm not saying you don't get a second chance. Uh, I think, you know, God is the God of second chances. But I think we would realize that we had missed something we had not used our time well. We would have missed out, in fact, on the whole point of living. So it's universal, but it's also cultural. How we enter and understand this experience is conditioned by the language and the symbols and the ideas of the particular time and place we're living in. We only have to see from what uh, is happening in France recently uh, and in many other parts of the world how different cultural symbols, different uh, ways of understanding the world uh, clash, can clash with each other and uh, create a terrible failure of understanding, terrible misperception and, and terrible violence. But it is also personal, this experience. And the experience itself is only real, not when we talk about it, but when we actually find it in a unique manifestation, which is our self. Who am I? What Jesus calls the true self. What does it profit anyone if they gain the whole world but don't ever really get to know their true being. So it's utterly personal and unique. There are as many unions with God as there are human beings. And each has, has always been, and always will be, every human being who's ever lived. 
will be and is a unique manifestation of and a unique relationship to God, the source, the ground of being. But at the same time, with all this incredible diversity, there is only one union. And this is made explicit in our understanding of the mystery of Jesus. Why did God become human? That's the, the great question that Christian faith offers the world. It's a question. I mean, there is an answer to it, many answers to it, many volumes, many libraries, but it's the question that is the most important. Why did God become human? And we repeat that question in the Christian tradition in different words, in different language, in different ways, in different eras. And we have to find the way to represent that question, to hear it, and to repeat it in our own Anthropocene era. And the first question that it raises is about who we are, who the person is. And that's a crucial question for modern people. Who am I? What is our identity? We have many identities, many credit cards, many e email addresses some, sometimes, many Facebook uh, identities. It's easy, easy to construct identities. At the same time, as we've constructed all these private identities, we have lost privacy, we've lost intimacy, we've lost those qualities that really make identity real. But each person exists not by excluding other people, that's one of the tragedies of our era, is the tragedy of exclusion, condemnation, and violence against people who are different from us. But no one exists by excluding other people. We exist, we become real, we thank God for the wonder of our being by doing the opposite. Not by excluding, but by resisting the temptation to possess ourselves, to hide ourselves within our multiple identities, within our false selves, within the constructed images of ourself that our culture often forces upon us, especially the young. The temptation to be isolated, to see ourselves as, for example, as Christians, as bits of Christ, rather than being wholly included in the person of Christ. In him there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female even, neither slave nor free. All of these socially constructed and even gender constructed realities are transcended in the person of Jesus. God becomes human in each one of us. So, that's something to send you to sleep tonight. <laughs> But a time of retreat like this is an opportunity to turn ourselves briefly wholly towards this mystery of ourselves and the mystery of God. And to begin to taste again the way those two mysteries interact and illuminate each other. 
the mystery of ourselves, the wonder of our being, and the mystery of God, who is known through God's own unknowability. And it's in this process of entering into that experience, of turning towards it wholeheartedly with our attention, it's in that experience that the mystery of Christ will grow stronger and clearer in each of us and for all of us. And turning towards this is what a retreat is about. It demands seriousness of purpose. The word serious shouldn't be uh, taken too seriously. But John Lane used to say, uh, seriousness leads to joy, solemnity leads to frivolity. <laughs> so when you start to get pompous and solemn and fundamentalist and exclusive and literalist and uh, 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 oppressive and, uh, and authoritarian and all of those things, then the, the joy goes out of it. And what happens is you just end up with something very superficial and often, in extreme cases, very nasty. But seriousness leads to joy. And seriousness is expressed in our ability and our, our, our willingness to pay attention. You know, if you really give your attention to something, you're being serious about what you're paying attention to and to the act of paying attention. It's deep respect for other people. Or for the book you're reading, or for the film you're watching, or for the, for the beauty of creation that you're contemplating, or for the music you're listening to. There's a deep respect there, serious respect, for the existence of that person or that thing that leads you to pay attention to it because you're giving yourself to it. That's serious. And it produces joy. The work of attention is at the heart of this whole process. It's this work of attention that actually leads us from one level of self-knowledge to the next. And that's why we can start to meditate at a very young age. That's why very young children can meditate. And very old people or somebody facing their last days of, on this earth that can learn to meditate. It doesn't matter where you start. Better, I think, the world would be a very different place if we all started uh, at four or five years old. And that, that hit me uh, some years ago when I was in Townsville uh, when we, they were starting to teach meditation in the schools there. And uh, they were making a film and I was wearing my habit, my white habit. And um, I was in this class of maybe six-year-olds, five-year-olds. It's probably six or seven or something like that. And uh, the teacher said, now we'll meditate. And they all jumped into action. And they started putting the meditation circle together and the little uh, candle in the middle of the room and the cushions. And they all began to sit around. And there was this little girl who was just staring at me, uh, or my habit, and uh, couldn't take her eyes off me. So I said to her, hello, what's your name? And she, she wouldn't didn't reply, she just stared like that. And uh, so after a couple more attempts, I, I said, you know, what, what, what's your name? And do you, what are you doing? And, uh, and she just looked at me and she said, are you an angel? <laughs> Which completely silenced me. Uh, but a few minutes later, I was sitting next to her on the ground. We were meditating together. No doubt she was closer to God than I was. But she was five or six years old, and she was still at that stage of awareness or development where she would think an angel might come and, and visit the class on a Tuesday afternoon. And uh, 
So, but we were both meditating together, she where she was and I wherever I was. So, we begin this work of attention precisely where we are. You begin where you are. So some of you may be meditating, or may be very new to meditation, maybe even meditating for the first time this evening, didn't know what you were letting yourselves in for. Uh, but that's exactly where each of us starts now when we meditate in a few minutes. We start where we are. And it's a wonderful journey and it is both certain that we will get somewhere and it is also unpredictable. So turning in that direction is what a retreat is about and it does demand this kind of seriousness of purpose that is uh, implicit in any uh, true work or act of attention. Now let me just say one more thing before we, maybe two more things before we meditate. As we turn our attention towards this thing that we can't name, And that's why meditation leads us into the work of silence. Perhaps the first thing we, we discover is the feeling that we are in the dark. We don't see where we're going in the same way as you would if you're reading a book, or you're planning an event, or a seminar, or you're thinking about a problem that you've got to solve. Then you may not have all the answers, but, but at least you can sort of see where you're going. But when you meditate, in one sense, it's being in the dark. And there's nothing wrong in that. It's being in the dark because when we meditate, we lay aside our thoughts. Every thought. Thoughts about God. Great insights into eternal realities. Uh, uh, solutions to the problems in your lives, F pleasant fantasies or daydreams, or old and painful anxieties and fears. Whatever it is, you lay aside. You don't fight it, you don't solve it, you don't try to resolve it, you don't try to cover it up, you don't try and sweep it under the carpet, you just let it go. You lay it aside. It's utterly radical. It's a total, a total act. At least that is what we do, we intend to do. We lay aside all of those thoughts as they arise. And that's why it can seem as if you're in the dark, because you say, people will often say when they're learning to meditate, so what should I be feeling? I don't understand this. What should I be thinking about? You know, should I, should, you know, I think I saw God during my meditation. Uh, was that all right? You know? And, you, you know, and then you say, no, forget about God. Uh, and they say, well, I can't, you know. So, it's, uh, it, it is baffling. It should be baffling. Dionysius, in the fifth century, one of the great sort of forces of the early Christian monastic movement said that the light of this mystery will at first seem like total darkness. There's a poem by Thomas Vaughan, there is in God, some say, a deep but dazzling darkness. There is in God, some say, a deep but dazzling darkness. And we all experience this when we begin to meditate, and as we continue to, to, to the journey, we will live with that darkness, but it will make more and more sense. It will become more and more a source of illumination. At first it will feel absurd, and often it feels as if it was a waste of time because we couldn't lay aside our thoughts at all. We just seem to be 
buffeted on every side by all our thoughts and distractions. So we judge the meditation. We're told not to judge it, of course, but we do. But the judgment of your meditation, the evaluation of your meditation, is just another thought. This is a total act. So you feel your meditation was a great meditation, lay that aside. You feel your meditation was a lousy meditation, lay that aside. And that is the journey. It's the laying aside of all of those thoughts. And this will teach us the meaning of faith. This is faith. Faith is our perseverance on the path of the mystery. I'm not saying it doesn't matter what you believe, it clearly does matter what we believe, but in meditation, faith is the simple perseverance. So entering that divine ray of darkness feels like, or as if it might be, a kind of unmaking of ourselves, a decreation, a loss of self, or a death of self. And so some people turn away from meditation because it's scary or because they just don't really want to, don't feel ready for that yet, or they, they, they don't understand it, so they're not going to get too close to it. But experience reveals the opposite. And perhaps you have to, later in life anyway, you have to come to meditation through some, uh, some anguish or some loss or some deep sense of something missing in your life. As a young child, I don't think you need to have that. As a young child, you just slip into it as something totally natural. But later, we have we have to be pushed into it. And the experience then reveals the opposite. This is not about destruction of ourself, but we are in fact being recreated, being remade. And we emerge from that remaking with some of our defects and problems healed. We find ourselves becoming more whole. So, a time of retreat, such as we begin now, is an opportunity to commit ourselves and to recommit ourselves more heartedly, wholeheartedly, to this whole journey of self-knowledge. Self-knowledge which leads us directly and, in a sense, effortlessly, just naturally, into the knowledge of God. And this is what we mean by going deeper. I would like to give up using the word deep for a year, but uh, you keep on coming back to it. It's one of those metaphors you can't really get away from. It's an interesting metaphor. And we, when we talk about it or use it, we generally use it positively. A deep meaning, a deep truth, a deep person. It implies, when we use the word deep, something out of the ordinary, precisely because it puts us into closer touch with the ordinary. Illusions and fantasies cannot survive depth. As we descend or go into this depth dimension. Don't think about it as spatial. It's not a spatial metaphor. It is a spatial metaphor, but don't take it literally. Uh, but as we go into this depth dimension, our illusions and our fantasies cannot survive. It's another reason why people give up meditation, because we think we need our illusions and fantasies. The complexities also unravel as we enter into this depth dimension because we become more simple. And falsehood and self-deception as we enter into this depth dimension have to give way to transparency and truth. So, I just want to 
Uh, so one more thing, and one more little suggestion about how you might uh, go into this uh, depth dimension during the retreat, something that might, might help you. First is the meditation and the mantra. I'll rerun the, the way of meditation in a minute. But in between the meditation periods, there are some other little exercises, such as uh, the, the contemplative walking and uh, the contemplative eating and the uh, contemplative showering and <laughs> contemplative closing of your doors and <laughs> locking of your doors above all. Um, so people don't become too present to you. Uh, so all of these things, actually, there's, there's, no, there's no, uh, no activity, no action in the next couple of days that doesn't have the capacity to open you to the full mystery of the universe. If you, we were to do it totally with presence and with clarity. One other little thing that might help you to maintain and to keep growing in that uh, contemplative state of mind, that attention uh, of, of, of being, uh, rather than drifting off and looking for distraction, either on your phone or in a magazine that you see lying around or in a shop that you might find uh, or something, rather than looking for distraction or talking with other people and distracting them, one little thing you can do are these little, uh, is a little poem called a haiku. How many of you have written haikus before? Oh, lots. Wow. Oh, you're haiku masters here. Well, uh, a haiku is a three-line, you know, classic Japanese form of poetry. It's a three-line poem. Uh, if you want to do it in a classical format, the first line should be five syllables. The second line is seven syllables, and the third line is five syllables, so five, seven, five. Now, I'll be honest with you, most of the uh, things that people write, they can be very lovely, beautiful, but they're not haikus. Not only because they are, you, you don't have to be exact about that if, if you don't need to be, but they shouldn't be sermons. They should be more like you know, uh, pictures you take. Everyone's taking pictures now because of iPhones and, and things. So uh, we become a, a, a generation of, of, of uh, snappers. Um, so it should be like that. I'll give you uh, three examples by the great 16th century Japanese haiku master, Basho. This is the first one. Wrapping dumplings in bamboo leaves with one finger. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll say it again. I couldn't read it. Wrapping dumplings in bamboo leaves with one finger, she tidies her hair. Oh, look of puzzlement there. What's it about? Okay? So that's it. It's not about anything. It's just about a woman who was wrapping dumplings in bamboo leaves and tidy with one finger and tidying her hair with the other. Something you might want to take a picture of. Why do you take pictures? Because something strikes you about it. Something beautiful, something unusual, something special. Or another one. Now I see her face, the old woman abandoned, the moon her only companion. It's three lines create such compassion, doesn't it? Or well, another one here. In the moonlight, a worm silently drills through a chestnut. Or, 
butterflies, butterflies flit in a field of sunlight. That is all. So, see if you can do as well as those. <laughs> and, and you could, if you just, if you follow these, these very meditative guidelines. What you write the haiku about should be an aspect of nature. So, not an idea, not a belief, not a thought, but just some, something in nature that you, 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 you are connected with. It should probably will be a fleeting experience that you observed, that you paid attention to. It should be in the present tense. It should be impressionistic. In other words, leave it to the reader to use their imagination. Don't tell them what it's all about. Let them work it out, feel it, as, you, as we could with those examples. And don't have any buts and ands or like in it. <laughs> Just the thing itself, okay? Not abstract and no title. So, the haiku then, as you can see, is, is, is an example or an illustration of this quality of pure attention, of pure presence, just an ordinary life. And the extraordinary thing is that the ordinary is so wonderful, so capable of revealing manifesting the whole picture. And that really is what beauty is. Beauty uh, has always been an object of great philosophical uh, inquiry. What is beauty? Well, the best example, the best definition of beauty or understanding of beauty is, is, I think, perhaps that beauty is when the whole reveals itself in a part in a, a small bit, but it contains and it gives itself through, uh, the whole gives itself through a part. So, if you uh, feel inclined, uh, be present to all of the little events, little happenings that uh, occupy the, the time of the retreat in between the uh, the formal sessions. Don't try not to let your mind uh, start wandering off in fantasy or looking for distraction. Try and be as present as you can. If you've been meditating already for some time, uh, you'll know, of course, that the mantra uh, accompanies you through ordinary, ordinary activities and ordinary time, ordinary life. So you'll, you'll find that probably easier to do. But even then, we all get distracted. So a little exercise like these haikus can just, uh, through a very, very simple uh, capturing of, of a moment of insight or a moment of a fleeting moment of beauty, it can capture. Don't get obsessive about it. There's somebody sitting up in the back there who once did. <laughs> once uh, got uh, rather compulsive about uh, haikus during a retreat, and uh, I think must have been producing about 20 perfect haikus a day. Uh, anyway, but enjoy it if you, if you like. And as I say, you don't have to be uh, puritanical about the, the purity of the format, but uh, try to keep it to three lines and keep it as, 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 as physical or as sensory as possible. That could, be, that could help you uh, prepare for your next meditation and, and give that wonderful experience, it should come from a, a retreat, that, uh, that reality is seamless. You know? We, 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 we always break up uh, into compartments the way we live. And uh, often these compartments are sealed off against each other. You know, people at work don't reveal themselves uh, or other parts of their lives to the people they work with and, and so on and so on. 
or people come home and they don't speak about what happened at work. So we often uh, hide, you know, in these compartments. So, but the time of retreat is to, to remember that actually life is, is a continuous, wonderful manifestation of, uh, of beauty and of, of God's gift of being. So let's, um, let's turn, let's end with our time of meditation. And just before I do, so we don't have to say it again, during the, uh, during the retreat, try to practice an external silence. Uh, and that re requires some self-restraint. If you have your Bible with you, read uh, the letter of James, uh, which talks about the, no one can live a spiritual life unless they can control uh, their tongue which is the rudder of the boat, he, he says. So uh, try to exercise that self-restraint. Uh, and it, it, it does literally mean that we, we, we don't speak to each other unless it's absolutely necessary. And if we do, we do it in a way that doesn't interfere with other people's silence. And although that might sound, if, you, if this is your first silent retreat, that, that might sound a little artificial or a little antisocial, uh, try it, just try it. And uh, you'll find that it, is, it has the opposite effect. It actually makes you feel more secure and, uh, and more uh, friendly, more close to the other people around you. So give it a chance. And those of you who, who, are, who have done silent retreats before, many of you, um, make this the opportunity to, to go e even more into that depth dimension. <laughs>